Thank you for coming out on a dreary day. Um, before we get started, uh, just we're not going to have any problems, but if for any reason, uh, you know, we need to exit the building, uh, exit the room, uh, just look out for me. I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what to do. We've got exits in the back and, of course, down the stairs uh, where you came in. So we've got a, a, great, in, uh, a great event uh, this morning. We have uh, Dr. Michael Griffin, uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Uh, he's the department's chief technology officer. Uh, he's responsible for all the uh, research, development, and prototyping across DOD. Uh, he oversees DARPA, the Missile Defense Agency, uh, the SCO, uh, the Defense Innovation Unit, lots of the fun things uh, within, the, uh, within the department. A lot of people in this room know uh, Dr. Griffin well. Uh, he's had an extraordinary career uh, with a lot of distinguished positions, uh, including some very interesting work at NASA and within the Strategic Defense uh, Initiative organization. Uh, we might hear about the Delta 180 uh, along the way here. Uh, so, so why don't we get started? We're going to do this as, as uh, very much of a conversation uh, and then uh, take some, some questions from the audience at the end. And I thought we might just kick it off by uh, kind of getting your, uh, your insight on what the national defense strategy at a high level means for, uh, means for missile defense. Well, uh, the national defense strategy is uh, in the end all about readiness. Okay, and it's about readiness for uh, a fight we might have to engage in today or next week, but also, and, and I think more importantly, about readiness for the fight we might have to engage in in the late 2020s. And by being ready for that, maybe we can avoid it. Because um, our, our Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Mattis is fond of saying that uh, what he wants to put into the mind of, of any adversary is when they look at the United States today and they make a decision about whether or not to take us on today, they conclude, no, we're not going to do that because we won't win. And his openly avowed goal is that his successor, successor, successor will be in charge of a Department of Defense that offers exactly that same calculus to the enemy with exactly that same result. They'll decide, nope, today's not the day either. And, and I think that's a really great way to look at it. So in research and engineering, what we are most responsible for is what is the shape of that future force? What is that future fight that we don't want to have to have? What does that look like? Uh, the other thing the national defense strategy is really about, it's about calling out the renewal of great power competition. We've been engaged since 9-11, uh, 17 years now, in uh, the Mideast fight, terrorism, violent extremist organizations, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the national defense strategy points out that while these are important things, uh, they are not for the United States existential that for us, uh, the resumption of great power competition with Russia and China and, and emphasis on China, if not managed properly, that can be existential. And so that is the focus of the NDS. And, th and that really means, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, its application to missile defense, thinking about how uh, active defenses can contribute to deterrence and defense against Russia and China. Is that fair? Well, absolutely. Um, Russia can, should it so choose, overwhelm the United States with a strategic nuclear attack, and as, as we can in reverse. We hope, above all things, that such an event never comes to pass, and one role of even limited missile defenses is to uh, confuse and confound such an adversary uh, with the question about ex exactly, if I choose to attack, exactly how much gets through and where does it get through. And, and that's an important value of missile defense. Well, you're a, a rocket scientist, rocket engineer. Um, as you kind of look past over the, the last couple decades, uh, you know, what kind of technologies and what kind of innovations uh, have you seen emerge and are still emerging that is going to make, you might say, the next missile age different qualitatively, quantitatively from, from those in the past? What, what are the what are the subsets? What are the technologies that, are, that, are, that have made things really change? Well, one of the things that we see emerging even today is, you know, the, the unmanned aerial vehicle, 
uh, we'll, we'll see other kinds of you know, unmanned ground vehicles, unmanned underwater vehicles. Um, this in combination with the idea of swarming attacks is uh, certainly concern and it may be a transformative concern. Uh, we need to learn how to defend against such things and we need to learn how to perpetrate our own versions of those. Uh, for defense against them, one of the things that I think will be most promising approaches is, is directed energy in one form or another. We often think about directed energy as large lasers, and I've certainly been involved with some of that for decades. But we also have high, par high power microwaves, uh, which can be very effective um, as an, what we call an electronics kill. So that sort of thing, um, it's really hard to envision handling swarming attacks by purely kinetic means. Um, so that's one of the future threats that I think we face. And presumably glide vehicle technology being another uh, big piece of that. Well, the, on, on not necessarily in a swarm, but certainly a, uh, we've seen the emergence over the last decade of particularly uh, Chinese uh, aggression in the form of multiple dozens of tests of hypersonic glide vehicles, rocket, rocket boosted long range gliding vehicles, uh, which can be designed to be highly maneuverable and thus very evasive, particularly in the terminal phase, um, which are relatively low signature compared to the kind of strategic missile threats we've faced in the past. Um, and for which we have not yet deployed uh, adequate defenses and for which we have not yet deployed our own counter offense. Uh, so that's an area which I've said is, is one of our major priorities and we'll be, we'll be working on. Right. I mean, in a way, it's, it's <coughs> shifting from uh, the, the focus on the 1990s of missile defense of just ballistics uh, to a very complex and integrated attack kind of things with all these different things coming at you simultaneously. Do you think the, the, the department is, is sufficiently seized of this, uh, you know, potential for these very complex attacks? I think we're, I, I think as a department we're really lined up on the criticality of modernizing our force structure, both offense and defensive, uh, against what we see coming in the future. Um, the trade we face in an environment where, you know, resources are always limited and we've spent uh, the last 17 years with, as I say, other priorities and then the decade before that was the cessation of the Cold War and the peace dividend. So it's been a long time since we've really reinvested uh, national treasure in modernizing our force. Uh, so we have a lot of ground to make up. Now, across the department, I think we're well lined up in the criticality of, of doing so. Um, we're also trying to balance that against um, being ready for today's fight. You know, an, enough, enough force structure uh, to be able to, to, deter, to deter adversaries today. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a difficult balance. but. I don't talk to anybody at all in the department who doesn't see the need to reinvest. I think, I think everybody's aware that the last time we really invested in transformative capabilities was in the Reagan era. Mm. Uh, you know, we introduced stealth fighters, stealth aircraft. We introduced um, GPS, precision guided munitions, high data rate encrypted communications. These things were transformative. Now, those transformations were initiated by actually one of my predecessors in the research and engineering world, uh, Dr. Bill Perry, who uh, I met later when he was on one of my boards of directors and who, of course, later became Secretary of Defense. Um, but that era was the last time where we just really heavily invested in capabilities which just overwhelmed the adversaries that we faced in Gulf Wars one and two and in Kosovo and Kosovo and, and other conflicts in which we've had to take part. Uh, 
um, the kinds of things we, we bought with that investment, however, you know, now they're available in Kmart. So if the United States is going to remain ahead, we have to reinvest. I mean, a, a generation or two has gone by since that era, and uh, other people are not stupid, and other people don't stand still. Uh, so it's, it's time for us to get back to work. So your job is to be at the forefront of, of those technologies and that kind of, that kind of transformation. Um, but you know, there's, other, there's other ways in which we can impose costs upon an adversary um, that might not be the, the most cutting edge and uh, technological things. I'm thinking kind of passive defense and deception uh, and frankly just really, really cheap mass. Uh, your thoughts on kind of how that might fit into this, this mix, this high-low mix? Well, we, we are looking at that as well. I mean, it, it, is, uh, uh, it will certainly cause an adversary to think more than twice, we hope, if uh, we were to have a couple of thousand conventional prompt strike uh, missiles available that individually didn't cost very much, but which were rather overwhelming in their quantity. Uh, and which we're capable of, of uh, what we can do today with, you know, accuracies the, in the range of the space we're sitting in right now. Uh, we, are, we are looking at that as well as very high uh, capability, cutting edge mm -hmm. uh, weapons of war. So you mentioned lasers uh, a minute ago and directed energy more broadly. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of investments do you see going on there in the near term that can really field what kind of capabilities? I'm thinking five years, the inside of 10 years kind of a thing. What, what's, what do you see there as, as, as happening soon? Well, broadly speaking, without trying to put too fine a point on it, where we are today is, um, I wanna be a little bit more forward leaning than to say in the lab, but in units of onesies or twosies, we can, we can roll out tens of kilowatts of, of, for example, laser power. Uh, in some particular technologies, we might be able to produce a bit more. Um, that is within a factor of two or three of being useful on a battlefield, on, on an airplane, on a ship, uh, even in space for limited purposes. Uh, that's a, a useful range. So, in my opinion, we are no more than a few years of having, particularly in the laser world, uh, directed energy weapons of, of military utility. We need to focus our efforts. Uh, it's, it's one of the old jokes in the directed energy world that, that uh, these systems are the weapons of the future and always will be. Right. So I regarded as one of my one of my jobs to get real capability uh, into operational hands and I think we're at most a few years from that now from there you need another factor of three or four to have a space control weapon a, a missile defense capability space-based boost phase or mid-course uh, capability with a, a large directed energy weapon. We need to be in the megawatt class to have that. And that's not right around the corner, but it's not utterly out of reach either. We can see the pathways to that. So you're going to see in upcoming budgets for missile defense, you're going to see a renewed emphasis on laser scaling uh, across several technologies because we feel we have to do that. So for every I think somebody said for every action, there's a reaction. Um, how do you see the investments in directed energy and the kind of the fieldings that you're talking about? How do you see that shaping the behaviors and imposing costs on the other great powers? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not inside the heads of our adversaries, um, so I won't comment on that one. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So let's talk a little about the sensors. Um, you're a, a very big proponent of space sensors. Um, going back to the, the specter of complex integrated attack that we talked about and all these diverse aerial threats, 
we've been focused on the ballistic threat for a long time. Uh, but it's not just about ballistics anymore, and the sensors that we need uh, are going to have to be different. What, how would you kind of think about the, the roadmap for a future air and missile defense sensor architecture? If you're talking about the near peer, isn't it going to have to be more sophisticated, more passive, more disaggregated, more survivable? That's going to be something different. And maybe that's in space, but maybe that also applies to other domains. Is that fair? Well, it, it is a fair question. Um, it's, it's no secret to anyone without getting into any sort of classified details. The United States has by far the most sophisticated uh, space surveillance capabilities of, of any nation. And these are concentrated in um, some number of very high value assets. Uh, my, my friend and colleague, General John Hyten, commander of uh, STRATCOM, has referred to these as juicy targets, quote unquote. Um, we have them for a reason. They're, as I say, their capability is, is unbelievable and unmatched. Um, but we, in the face of uh, particularly the Chinese and Russian threat, we see the need to disaggregate uh, our capabilities uh, to present less of a, a focused target. Uh, we also, uh, I've mentioned the hypersonic threat earlier. Uh, this is a threat with a much reduced signature factor of 10 or 20 times less than the strategic missile threat that we've dealt with, with which we've dealt in the past. So we need to be somewhat closer to the action. Um, this group will know that the Congress has mandated um, that we uh, deploy a uh, persistent, timely, global uh, sensor, space sensor layer uh, for exactly these reasons, for reasons of disaggregation and resilience, um, to present a, a less concentrated attack surface to the adversary. Uh, and to be able to get after the emerging threat that we see today. This is not a threat in the future. We, we know that China, and China in particular, has done dozens of tests of hypersonic systems. Um, Russia has done fewer, but still impressive. Uh, this is a threat that our adversaries are developing. Now, it's interesting to note, I, I have noted in other fora, that the United States did all the fundamental research in these areas. Um, we really did, and we published much of it. Uh, it was not a capability we chose to weaponize. Uh, we didn't think that the world needed necessarily more weapons, and the United States doesn't seek adversaries. Other people have sought to be our adversaries and are succeeding at that. And so our choice is how and, and when and where do we respond, but we have to respond. So if they choose to weaponize these capabilities, then, then we will have no choice but to respond in kind. So staying on the space sensors for a moment, um, uh, I wonder if you might sort of walk us through the, uh, the relative strengths and weaknesses uh, uh, of different kinds of orbits there. Uh, low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, maybe some sort of combination of those. Uh, what's, what's your feelings on that? Well, my basic feeling is that the United States needs to um, be prepossessing in space. Uh, we need to make it clear, uh, as we have done in multiple presidential policy statements, uh, that the United States will m secure and maintain freedom of access to and and uh, ability to move in space for ourselves and our allies. Uh, the use of space is critical to how we fight wars, whether on air, land, or sea. Uh, and so our adversaries know that, and we know that they are developing systems that come after our space war fighting systems because they control how we fight on Earth. So we need to be prepared to protect and defend those assets. We need to be able to project our own power 
uh, on our adversaries' assets because they seek to do us harm. Now, with regard to, you asked me to talk about sensors and what are the ramifications of being in various orbits and with various capabilities, uh, I don't want to be in any one orbit. Uh, we are, our, our efforts today are concentrated in what we call geostationary orbit, the 24-hour orbit, uh, which remains fixed from an Earth point of view over one plot of ground. And then we make good use of other orbits as well. I want us to be uh, as widely distributed over as many choices of orbital regime uh, as we can effectively use because I want to pose the adversary such a difficult problem that they'll choose not to fight it. Um, we are not as, uh, I would say, prevalent in low Earth orbit as I would like us to be. And again, I think we need to proliferate our capabilities there because uh, one of the emerging threats that we see is the hypersonic threat, which again, with a much reduced signature, in order to, to see it, track it, provide fire control quality information, we really need to be closer to the action. Um, we need to be proliferated and resilient so that removing a few of those satellites by the adversary doesn't alter our capability. So we need, we need to think about space as a domain which our adversaries seek to remove from our use and respond accordingly. Okay. So let me bring the sensor uh, discussion down to Earth. Uh, uh, to Good luck with that. To uh, uh, land-based and, and sea-based. Um, you know, as you think about, uh, frankly, radar has been around for almost a century, better part of a century. Um, and there's a lot of new technologies on the radar side. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that, but also how we can use uh, radars differently and perhaps in more uh, sophisticated ways that will make it harder for a, uh, a radar homing missile from the bad guys to, uh, to, to come after and suppress those, those assets. So it's, maybe it's a combination of, of, of layered defenses for air defense, uh, and maybe there's kind of some uh, use of pa radars as passive receivers. Your, your thoughts on, on more sophisticated ways of, of doing that? Well, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here on how we're planning to deal with that. Uh, your basic point is that active radars are a target. Um, we've used them for a long time. Um, both we and our adversaries have, uh, you know, homing anti-radiation missile types of, of things. So in, in the event of conflict, radars become a target. Uh, one way of dealing with that is to have the illuminator uh, that provides the radar signature, or signal rather, uh, not co-located with the receiving entities. That's called semi-active radar. It's a, uh, a very old technology. Uh, you know, the, the venerable standard missile started out with a uh, semi-active mm -hmm. approach. We're relooking at all of that. Uh, we're not unaware that active radars are a target. Okay. Um, so let me stay in, or let me go back to space for a minute, uh, and, and specifically in terms of uh, space based interceptors, kinetic. Uh, you've talked about that. Uh, you've talked about kind of the uh, desirability of that. I, I wonder if you might uh, talk about whether that kind of a space layer, to what extent is that maybe useful for the for the boost glide uh, hypersonic threat? Well, the point, of, uh, the point of a hypersonic threat is that you're talking about very rapid uh, launch to target intervals, a ten, couple tens of minutes maybe, um, where the Launching signature is certainly very observable from space, uh, but the threat signature during cruise is, as I've said a couple times, uh, much reduced over what we are normally used to seeing for threat signatures. Um, we, can, we can see it and find it. We, we have done so even from geostationary orbit, but that's kind of not the way to go for um, to produce 
real-time targeting quality information. As I've said, we really think we need to be closer to the action. Um, why from space? Well, it's a really big ocean, and most of the assets we have that would be adversary targets are our forward deployed bases, Guam, you know, Kadena, other, other places, or carrier strike groups that, are, that could be held hostage by such adversary capabilities. Uh, we can't wallpaper the ocean with radars to see these things coming, and we need to have some amount of warning if we're going to, to defend against them. Uh, our existing radar systems don't provide that kind of warning, and we will never, ever hit a threat we can't see coming in time. So I, I'm reluctant to say the only way about anything, but we haven't been able to identify a more productive way in which to know that this threat is inbound than to do so from space. Okay, the signatures that we're looking for are readily observable from space. Uh, these hypersonic threats are fairly hot, bright targets. Uh, we can see them. Uh, we need to be able to see them in time to converge a fire control solution and be able to get our asset into the, into the fight. Um, if this were, uh, if, if, if this were a landmass kind of a conflict that we were foreseeing instead of a conflict over broad ocean areas, my answer could well be different, mm. but it's not. And so, in, we, broadly speaking, the United States needs persistent, timely, global uh, awareness of, of what is going on. But, but saying on the, the, the space-based interceptor side of things, I mean, what, what would be the challenges for, for using a space layer uh, for coming back down into the high atmosphere for well, this mission? I, I'm probably, for this mission, for the hypersonic defense mission, uh, I, I don't see a space-based interceptor as a workable technical solution. Basically, you're having to do an atmospheric entry uh, to go after the, the threat target. The space-based interceptor concept is most useful against um, strategic missile boosters and, and post-boost vehicles. Uh, that's very yeah, high. Exo. Yeah, exo-atmospheric, or yeah, it's, it's very high leverage there. Uh, it's not a useful approach for something cruising at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 kilometers of altitude. Okay. Um, well, maybe transition a little bit. You're very uh, known for go, you know saying going faster, please. Uh, so much of that has to do with the authorities <coughs> of the people who are charged and and motivated to go fast. Uh, you know, this was one of the the things that really kind of characterized the creation of the Missile Defense Agency back in the 2004 time frame is the consolidation of a lot of authorities in, in one person. Uh, and so I wonder if you might, uh, you know, from where you sit and your desire to go fast, um, your particular uh, uh, sense of the importance of that, say within the Missile Defense Agency, and whether that needs to be a model in maybe other entities and, and kind of how we think about defense acquisition more broadly. Well, from the secretary on down, uh, the desire to uh, refresh our decision-making processes in favor of greater speed, uh, that desire is, is uniform. There, there's nobody who's going to stand up and say, I think we're moving too quickly. Uh, the secretary talks about making decisions at the speed of relevance. Uh, we see our adversaries turning around their experiments on the kinds of time cycles that we used to do. Uh, we've had the luxury now of, of a whole generation and more of not having great power competition, not having to respond so quickly. Um, we don't have that luxury anymore. Uh, we are going to, you know, we're going to have to relearn how to conduct development programs quickly and get things into the field. Uh, we have a, a long history of knowing how to do this and in a very demonstrable ways. We just haven't done it much recently. I'm fond of pointing out that uh, it, it took 
Secretary Gates' uh, personal involvement. He made it his personal hobby to move MRAP along because he thought the dangers to our uh, troops in the field from improvised explosive devices were so, uh, so f significant and that the, the conventional acquisition system just wasn't paying attention to it. He, he writes extensively about it in his autobiography. Um, that shouldn't have to happen. I mean, that's really the point of that discussion. That shouldn't have to happen. Uh, we need to relearn how to move at the speed of relevance. Now, I would, you asked about MDA being an example in that regard. I would like Missile Defense Agency, which now reports to me, to set that pace. Uh, I ask them to become that example of about the second day after I was sworn in. Um, I will need to check back in with them to see uh, how they're compressing their decision-making timeline. Uh, I, I, I hear from outside, you know, outside the Defense Department all the time uh, about how slow we in DOD are. Uh, our, our, our secretary acknowledges that. We need to move more quickly. Um, I guess I should stop there. So part of I mean part of it's really the uh, the consolidation of authorities in one person and quick decision making, but the other side of that, the flip side of that is uh, a, a focus, a focus on one problem or a, a couple problems. And the Missile Defense Agency has the word missile uh, in their name, uh, and so in that respect, how do you see, uh, if you'd like to talk about it, the uh, really the, the the roles and missions uh, of a missile defense centric entity? Uh, to be able to focus on one thing, and maybe it's not just the ballistic missile defense anymore and the BMDS, but maybe it's a, a couple sets of, of missile problems. Um, how, do you, how do you see that maybe evolving as the threat is evolving? Well, the United States faces a, a lot of different kinds of adversary threats. There's not just one way they come at us, but one of the ways that they come at us and have for a long time is, is with missiles of various number, scale, and scope. Uh, so it was, it was President Reagan who initiated a, a focused program of strategic missile defense in the 90s that evolved and, and the OOs that evolved into theater and, and tactical missile defense, um, much of which in my view has been highly successful. Um, I think there's value in having a missile defense agency with that core responsibility rather than distributing that focus out across the services in the department. Uh, I, I see value there. Others sometimes disagree. Uh, I saw a lot of value, enormous value, in the early OOs when um, President Bush, Vice President Cheney, uh, argued for providing the Missile Defense Agency with its own acquisition authority mm -hmm. so that it could not have to go through the broader Department of Defense acquisition authorities. Uh, in my view, we don't always use that as aggressively as we could, but it's nice to have the authorities. Uh, so I see value in, in, in having a concentrated focus by an agency on a particular class of threat. Now, Secretary Carter, uh, when, when the emergence of Chinese hypersonic threats became, uh, came to the fore, Secretary Carter uh, assigned the hypersonic missile defense threat also to MDA. I think that was appropriate. I've not, I've not chosen to realign that. Um, so as adversaries come up with new approaches, we may have to come up with new responses, but I think broadly speaking, missile defense lodged in a particular agency is a good thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean uh, entity with the word you know, missile defense in its name is going to wake up every morning and be focused on that. Um, it's been, what, 16 years since you know, the end of the ABM treaty. Um, we've got four families of, of missile defenses out there fielded and being operated by the services. Um, to what extent do you think that 
within our lifetimes, uh, the service cultures will uh, really adapt, really change all that much to make missile defense or air, air and missile defense rather, and hypersonic defense one of their core missions and identities, or is that probably unlikely to happen? I'm not notably good at predicting the future, except in cases where I think bad will happen, and I'm remarkably good at predicting bad. Uh, I'm not so good at predicting good. Um, let, me, let me offer that, you know, frankly, in, in the larger Department of Defense scheme of things, I don't think it matters what entity wearing what badge is addressing a particular problem as long as the problem's getting addressed. Uh, it is unlikely, I think, that the Army, Navy, or Air Force will embrace a missile, a given style of missile defense, a given arena of missile defense capability, until and unless they have a dog in that particular fight that, that with which they're co-aligned. Um, so much of what we do for missile defense capabilities that is designed, developed, deployed by the Missile Defense Agency will have to be continued to be sustained by the Missile Defense Agency unless there is a, a, uh, a high degree of shared utility with a particular service and then the service might take it on because the services have their own priorities. And if, if uh, broadly speaking, within their total obligational authority, they're gonna align whatever money they have consistent with those priorities, and a missile defense capability that doesn't line up well with their other priorities will not necessarily get funded. Right. Now, I mean, th this, uh, this has a very sharp uh, issue at the end of it, and you know where I'm going on this. And uh, that's the question of, uh, of transition and transfer. Uh, and so much, as these four families have been fielded, a lot has been transferred to the services in terms of operations and sustainment. And we got UE, the upgrade early warning radars, we got uh, Patriot and, and THAAD and, and uh, SMs, Aegis being operated by the services every day. Um, and yet there is a particular uh, question uh, on, the, on the stove at the moment about whether the material procurement of that piece of, of, of those pieces of the BMDS, and they're big ticket items, whether that also ought to be transferred uh, to the services where they'll have to compete for all these other priorities on, on a year in and year out basis. Uh, your, your thoughts about if that, that transfer happens, whether, uh, whether it be good or bad for, for sustaining the mission? I, I don't think it's gonna happen, and if it did, I don't think it's gonna be good. Um, asking the Navy to prioritize an SM3 system over another carrier, uh, that's maybe not a fair question. Um, asking the Army to prioritize that over another brigade combat team, I mean, maybe that's not a fair question. Those are questions of the architecture of what our national defense looks like uh, that maybe rise to the secretary or the OSD level, not the responsibility of a given service. Mm -hmm. So today, uh, those particular systems that you mentioned, THAAD and SM3, things like that, uh, those are prioritized at the Department of Defense level, and maybe that'll just continue. Good. Well, that's basically what I've got. Um, I wanted to see if we can open it up to the, the audience and, and sure. take, take some questions. Uh, if as, if I, as if I could see. <laughs> Raise your hand, um, we'll have a mic go around. Maybe we'll start right up here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, uh, Genevieve, maybe may bring it up here. Um, we'll um, just state your name and uh, keep it in the form of the interrogative. And, uh, and so if can, the question could be short enough that I can remember can, it by the time you're done, <laughs> that would be really good. All right. Thanks very much, it's Mike Stone from Reuters. I'm wondering about the missile defense review. It's been complete for months. Obviously, you were gonna get this question. Why hasn't it emerged? And why can't it be shared with the enterprise to reinvigorate the missile defense enterprise? Um, 
it will be shared when the administration is ready to share it and not before, and I'm not in charge of that, either that question or that answer, so I don't have an answer for you. All right, I think we got one over here. I did, I did bet five bucks, that'd be the first question. Well, of course, <laughs> I have no problem with it, but I can't answer it for you, so. Tom, thanks for hosting this event. Uh, Vince Alcazar, Mitchell Institute Air Force Association. Dr. Riffin, uh, at the end of October, we released uh, a short paper advocating for air boost phase intercept rapid prototyping and development. It's in six, uh, section 1676, which you referred to in the NDAA for FY19. I'm holding a report that probably is familiar to you. I, in our research, we came across January 1988, Dr. Mike Griffin, American Rocket Company, and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Rendine uh, wrote a great report, Delta 180 Vector Sum, which you referred to, Tom, and getting ABPI out of the idea stage to an actual capability stage as a bridge capability to some of these other technologies that you've talked about, what out of here could we import into ABPI development that could speed the process rather than the six to seven years that General Greaves believes MDA needs to produce ABPI capability? Thank you. BPI, boost phase intercept. For the, right. Everybody else. I got it. Uh, well, Delta 180 was a flight experiment for which I was the chief engineer and Lieutenant Colonel Rendine was the uh, government program manager. Um, that was a space-borne boost phase intercept experiment against a, a target and powered flight. Uh, that was a lot of fun to do. It had never been done before and it was very gratifying to see it be successful. Um, it's 32 years and a couple of months ago that we launched it, so I would offer that not much about the technology has any relevance today, uh, if anything. I hope technology has moved on in three decades. Um, the style of program execution is the kind of thing we would like to restore to the department in our prototyping and experimentation efforts. Uh, we weren't part of any formal acquisition authority. It was without attempting to appropriate the title. It was a classic Skunk Works style development. Uh, it was extraordinarily successful. We did indeed score a hit to kill. Um, so that kind of programmatic style is what I would like to see us put in place as we develop new capabilities in the department. That experiment was followed on by several others of, of uh, diverse nature having in common that they <coughs> had not been done before and were done in a very expedited style. It was probably the most rewarding period of my career. I'm often asked if, if uh, the question starts out with its own conclusion, I'm often asked if running NASA wasn't the coolest thing I ever did and I worked for NASA four times the last time I ran it. Um, but the coolest thing I ever did was that set of experiments in the late 80s and early 90s where we, uh, we were able to run at full speed and, and do things that had never been done before. Great, all right, who else? So I will take this one right here and then we'll come over here. Should we be expecting some other cool experiments like that in the, in the I, coming year? I hope so. Hi, Benjamin Din with Bloomberg. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, in June you testified before the House Armed Services Committee and you expressed concerns over Chinese exfiltration of U.S. intellectual property and technology as well as uh, mentioning concerns about supply chain access. I think you uh, singled out microelectronics. My question for you is, uh, since then has the Pentagon uncovered more evidence of Chinese attempts to hack the U.S., whether through software or hardware vulnerabilities? Um, I'm not going to comment at all on uh, U.S. and specifically defense vulnerabilities to uh, hacking by adversary nations or exfiltration. 
uh, the testimony in that hearing was, was carefully thought through. Um, what I'm going to do is to refer you to Vice President Pence's superlative speech about a month ago uh, talking about Chinese behavior across the board to include exfiltration, to include a bunch of things. I'm going to refer you to that speech. Read it. Pay attention. Uh, it was a superlative speech, uh, and I'm, I, won't say, I won't say more. All right. Uh, over here in the red tie, up, up front here. Wait for the mic, if you would mind. I'm Carlos Avillon. I'm an economist. I, um, well, I had a couple courses in economics. I liked them a lot, but I'm not an economist. <laughs> um, the, the reason why China has become um, such a big threat is because its rate of economic growth is so much faster than that of the U.S. And uh, um, most, most defense experts um, seem resigned to the idea that as that big gap between the rates of growth of the two countries continues, eventually China will have a much larger economy and thus it will have more weapons, produce more weapons every year, and perhaps even with matching technology. And then um, have you also have this perception within your colleagues that it's inevitable. I'm saying that because I've been doing research for two decades, and I've developed an, a new economic theory, very outside the box, very kind of classic, that would guarantee a rate of economic growth for the U.S. that would match that of China and would not make this situation inevitable. Well, I don't regard, I, I regard very few things as inevitable. I'm, I'm not going to comment on economic theories because of the profound level of my ignorance of such things. Um, China was admitted to the World Trade Organization in 2001, championed by the United States in that regard, uh, and under disadvantaged nation status with the hope that they would play by the rules of the world, you know, the world order. Um, they've not done so. Uh, the speech I just mentioned by Vice President Pence a few weeks ago calls out that behavior, as, has, uh, as have many, many other organizations and entities to uh, include, actually, uh, in a publication I regularly read, The Economist, uh, pointing out that Western nations have been victimized by China's abuse of, of, of the rules. Uh, that in part accounts for their rapid rate of growth. Um, the U.S. is responding, and we're going to continue to do so. I don't see that China's dominance of the world economic order as, as being inevitable. Uh, nor do I see that a, uh, nor do I concede that a command economy uh, can outpace an, an economy that's driven by people who have the freedom to innovate uh, and to fail and to start over again. I, I can't say how those things are going to come out. Um, So no, neither I nor my colleagues regard th this as a, an inevitable result. We, uh, we intend to make sure that America can keep to its commitments to its allies and partner and have a defense so strong that, that Chinese aggression will not be rewarded. Got one right here and then we'll move to the back over here. Uh, Courtney Stad with Vector Launch. Mike, it's great seeing you there. Just good, wonderful. Good to having, see you, Courtney. Having you in this position. Uh, the Space Development Agency, uh, curious to get your perspective on uh, status, its scope, and within your authorities, are you able to stand it up or do you have to uh, await for congressional action? Uh, the whole issue of the Space Development Authority or agency and, and what we do in space is 
uh, forgive me, uh, still up in the air. Um, the, this question even arises out of NDAA 18, where in section 1601 of, of the law, the Deputy Secretary of Defense was charged with um, telling Congress how the department is going to reform its management of, of the space enterprise. Um, the Space Development Agency is, is one of the tools we offered up as a way that we're going to re-energize the space development culture, uh, shorten the time cycles that we talked about, bring some new things to the table. Uh, that was part of our response back to Congress in the 1601 report. Um, the further details of what we do inside the department it's, it's not even that I know and can't tell you. If I knew and couldn't tell you, I would just tell you that I can't tell you. We don't have that settled yet. So beyond saying that, you know, the deputy's working on it, that the senior leadership of the department is in regular discussions on the matter, if I go farther than that, I'm, I'm getting out ahead of my headlights. Sorry. Well, we don't want you to do that, but um, can I nevertheless connect that with the, the issue of, of space sensors? And, and you mentioned that uh, the hypersonic threat has been assigned to MDA. Do you, to, as of today, do you see the, uh, the acquisition of that space sensor layer being an MDA thing, or is that also up in the air? Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure I see it being solely an MDA thing, um, although I, I, without question, they're part of the process. The Congress has specifically directed us to deploy a space sensor layer. Uh, we're going to do that. I mean, while I'm at least sitting in my position, we're not gonna openly violate the law. We're, we're told to do this and, and we will be. Now, I think most of you here are familiar with the DARPA blackjack solicitation, which is in you know classic DARPA fashion, uh, uh, an, an open, uh, solicitation for an experiment to deploy multiple uh, small, we hope cheap, surveillance spacecraft, link them together, um, uh, look at how they function as a network, um, and then go from there to something which can be transitioned for to actual deployment. Uh, what, what the boundary is between DARPA and MDA or other uh, elements of the department, I, you know, I don't know yet. Okay. I, I want to make the experiment work first. I'd, I'd rather not leap off the cliff until we have an example of a, of a working prototype that we believe can scale. I mean, the, the question I was asked earlier about boost phase, you know, airborne boost phase defenses. And I said the technology no longer applies. It's 32 years old, but the programmatic style and the way of thinking do apply. And that's what I mean here. This, the DARPA blackjack would be a classic example. So do you have a, a window within which time uh, scaling up uh, a constellation or a space sensor layer? Do you have a window of time that you think it really needs to be uh, you know, not just the first satellite, but enough of the constellation to actually deliver well, some capability. Well, I mean, the day before yesterday, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I want us, I wanted us already to have been working on it. So when I was sworn in on February 20th, we, we weren't. Now we are, and I trust that we will continue to do so because we need to do it. Um, I don't want it to be dependent upon me or any other individual member of our team. But 2030 is uh, too late. Uh, we'll get it as soon as we can get it. I'm not going to. Got it. I, I don't have dates to give you. Okay. All right. I'm not, again, I'm not, it's not that I have dates in my head that I'm not telling you. It's that we're working on it. Very good. We have one in the back over here. Yeah, yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jack Pappas. I'm an old guy, and I'm one of the three guys that got the ATBM originally into the federal budget in the late 70s and early 80s. I have uh, 
three questions that all bear on uh, uh, development of the, uh, of the business. First of all, are there any plans to do a career enhancement program to recognize the, uh, the um, uh, missile defense business as of value to the military and to the nation? And in the process of that, what, what steps uh, do you contemplate taking to do a cultural reorganization of the relationships among the defense agencies and, and looking at the acquisition aspects of being able to, to buy something once you organize to do so, um, would it make sense to create a special emphasis procurement system that would be one that we would like it, how we would like it to be so that eventually the existing procurement system could be transitioned into a more effective organization. So it's, it's people, culture, and buying. Well, uh, I don't know anything about career enhancement programs for people working in missile defense. Um, I am not an expert on culture change. And my counterpart, Ellen Lord, who is in charge of the actual acquisition policies in the department would be a more suitable target for your last question. So you're going to go zero for three on that one. Sorry. All right. That's, that's a maneuvering uh, vehicle there. Uh, well, let me just thank you again for all your time here. Um, uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, but, you know, as I said in the beginning, you've had such a, an amazing career over the years. Um, what's the sort of thing that we can do as a country to, to generate more Mike Griffins uh, for defense? Not sure you want more of those. One might, one might be enough. Many would argue that one is one too many. Um, look, I, I, but I get the spirit of your question. Um, the, the, real, the really important part of your question is what can be done to generate by the time they get to be old, senior organizational leaders who have a, a deep technical background, because that's all I have going for me. I've, we've agreed that I'm not an economist, I'm not an expert on culture change, and you know, I can't see well enough ever to have worn a, a uniform. But, but also a sense of urgency. But, but the sense of urgency. So what the United States, um, has going for it is that when we make it clear that things are important, uh, our people and especially our younger people uh, rise to those challenges. So uh, I'm a, in a way a little bit of an, I mean, I'm a Sputnik generation kid, right? Now I'm a little bit different because I was interested in space from the time I was five years old, which was several years before Sputnik. Uh, so when it came along, I had the advantage actually of knowing what it was and being able and, and relatively. So I was that kid in third grade who could explain to his teacher why it didn't fall <laughs> down. Um, but my whole generation benefited from that challenge. I went to college on scholarships that were motivated by the need to train, tech, to, tr to provide technical training and incentives for kids to study those things. Uh, you know, my, my family was far from wealthy. Um, my mom worked her way through college over a 10 year period by doing a semester as a waitress and then a semester at college. I didn't have to do that because I and many of my ilk benefited from the kinds of national response to, to the Sputnik challenge. Um, if we want similar generations of leaders in the future, we have to recognize, as our national defense strategy states, that we are in an era of renewed great power competition fully as significant as what we once called the Cold War. Uh, China's not Russia, they behave differently. Russia today is not the Soviet Union, it behaves differently. But it behaves in ways, both of those nations behave in ways that are not favorable to the United States. Um, we need to respond to that. If we make it a priority, then the young kids who 
you want to come along and eventually be leaders, uh, they will respond to that challenge. But we at the national level have to make it clear that this matters, that this is a priority for the United States, the Western world, our partners and allies. If we don't make it clear, uh, then we, we cannot require of our younger folks that they take it as a priority. Well, thanks. It does matter. And thank you for, uh, for taking up the challenge. And thank you for your time today. Please join me in thanking Dr. Griffin. Thanks.